Well, I'm uh, very thankful to Jordan Peterson, who insisted that we should meet. Uh, Dr. Warren Farrell, we're here in your home in California. Uh, you are a remarkable academic by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you're an author, you're a public intellectual. You've been very active on the question of relations between men and women. You've also been politically active. You ran for governor as a Democratic candidate here in California. You were supportive of Hillary Clinton's bid for the White House. You've been active on gun controls. But perhaps nowhere have you become better known than as uh, perhaps America's best known male feminist in the 1970s. You've always been very interested in the role or the roles between men and women. But now you've written a remarkable book warning us that our boys are in crisis. And in fact, that's what you've called it, the boy crisis. It's packed with research that's dense to the point where you can't deny that it has to be grappled with, it can't be pushed under the carpet, and it's very confronting. Indeed, yes. I was really increasingly shocked when I saw that the boy crisis was a global crisis, that it's in, in all 56 of the largest developed nations. Our boys are falling behind our girls in every academic subject especially in reading and writing, which are the two biggest predictors of success. And so I started to say, well, you know, what is there about the developed nations that is so, you know, that is leading to boys doing so poorly? And so what I began to see is a bit ironic is that, you know, we all want to have survival not be controlling our lives. And developed nations have done a good job helping, usually with capitalism, helping um, people move forward and not having to be you know, dictated every minute by survival. And so that survival, to, is, the good news is that it creates new freedoms. The bad news is the unintended consequences of some of those freedoms. And one of those freedoms is the freedom to divorce. And another freedom is the freedom to have children without being married. And so among divorced um, couples, um, a very high percentage of them do not have a lot of father involvement, either no father involvement or mi very minimal father involvement. And there, both the children are doing much worse than the ones that have both father and mother involvement. And so the, um, those children, especially the boys who have minimal or no father involvement, are really part of the boy crisis. I began to see that the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside. The other group where that's true of was, um, uh, was women who are under 30 who have children without being married. And so when uh, women who are under 30 have children without being married, which is 53% of the women under 30 who have children in the United States um, are not married, uh, the children and the, often the woman doesn't know who the father is, or they know that the children know the father very minimally, or when the father and mother live together, when the mother and father are, uh, have the child, um, the father, the average time of the father's involvement is only four years. And so those children often feel abandoned by their father. And the boys in particular, um, they look in the mirror and um, if they hear um, negative things about their father or after, the, after a divorce or their breakup, um, let's say they hear that the father's a liar or a narcissist or irresponsible, um, the boy looks in the mirror and he sees, you know, well, maybe I'm, 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 my body language is like my dad's. Maybe I'm inherently a, a narcissist or I'm irresponsible or I'm a liar. And, um, and of course, we're all narcissists, irresponsible or a liar to some degree. And so you pick up that part of you and that boy starts worrying about himself being that way. But I also started to see that, you know, what is there about fathers that is so important? Um, I didn't, um, you know, I knew that fathers were important, but I didn't have a clue uh, that the absence of a father, uh, for a boy in particular, leads to a boy having problems in more than 50 areas, leads to a girl having problems in more than 50 areas, but a boy is more likely to have those problems be more severe, more, uh, more likely to result in suicide, severe depression, um, addiction to opioids and death by opioids and these types of disastrous problems or the boy becoming so dysfunctional and ashamed of his own lack of success that he becomes angry at the fact that his teachers aren't giving him any positive feedback, his peers are not paying attention to him. 
And for boys, when it comes to boy-girl time, if he feels he's a sensitive boy, um, and his mother uh, oftentimes will help him see how sensitive and caring he is because his mother is usually very sensitive to him. And then that boy is sensitive and then is re being rejected by girls because girls tend to date winners, not losers. And he's now experiencing himself as a loser because he doesn't accomplish things very well. Um, he then becomes angry and hurt and withdrawn. And if the video game addiction doesn't t satisfy him or the alcoholism or the drugs don't satisfy him, um, he can turn to uh, porn, which will addict him to um, uh, gir girls and women as objects rather than as real people. And um, he then that which leads to more rejection by the girls who feel treated as objects because they're being treated as objects. And, um, and so all of these things happen. And those are the boys that are uh, set up for the mass shooters, for um, not having a good role model in their dad. So they look to ISIS or some other larger sense of purpose that their dad didn't provide, or they become our prisoners. In the United States, 93% of the prison population is male. And about 90% of that um, group is dad-deprived males. And as with mass shooters, about 85% are dad-deprived males as well. And so, and then we have um, um, among the ISIS recruits, about 80 to 90% are not only males, but dad-deprived males. So Warren, these things are, I think, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. But before we go any further, let's establish that both of us are delighted to see that girls are doing very, very well in a whole range of ways, including something you don't hear much about, particularly under 30s. I think you say in 147 cities in America in your book, your studies reveal, they are earning on average 8% more yes. than young men of that age. Yes. So this is not about a boy versus girl thing at all. Let's, let's say that right up front. We both would rejoice. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, John and I, between the two of us, have five daughters, and <laughs> uh, and um, and I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City for um, three years, and spoke all around the world on the importance of women's issues. And to me, uh, women, you know, uh, for me, you have to be pro-female and pro-male if you're pro-human. Uh, for me, when only one sex wins, both sexes lose. And so my job has been to make sure that the first part of my life was focused on making sure that you know women were powerful in the workplace, they weren't discriminated against in the workplace. I'm very happy that with hashtag Me Too movement allowed women to be able to speak up and tell their truths. But I've also come to understand that hashtag Me Too needs to not be a monologue, it needs to be a dialogue. Um, the way that the sexes will move forward is both sexes listening to each other. Um, for years, I spoke around the world, and I did um, I, I did role reversal experiences. Um, I said to every woman, uh, to every man and woman in the audience, I said, "Men, if you really came here to understand women, you got to understand that every woman is in a beauty contest every day of her life. And if you want women uh, to, if you want to really understand women, you've got to be in that beauty contest and experience what that's like." So I had every man in the audience, sometimes 500 men, come up on stage and and f flood the, um, the the aisles and all go through. The women created a, a sort of a, uh, an arch through which the guys would go through. And then the women would choose, they would be the judges in the beauty contest. And they would choose the guys that they felt they were most attracted to and why. And then we did um, moral virtue questions. And then we did um, uh, talent. Um, and the guys said at the end, I had this extraordinary experience, which is that Every part of me wanted to win this beauty contest and wanted to have my body be the one that was chosen as number one. And every part of me was angry that I was only being looked at for my beauty. Um, and the women would say, wow, thank you. That's exactly what we go through. But then I said, okay, this is a role reversal experience. We're both going to um, support each other and, and understand each other. And so the women, I then programmed the women to ask out the guys they were most attracted to and worked with the men 
to only be responsive for the, for the, for, to the girls and women who were earning the most money, who could support the, the children in a style to which they would like their uh, children to become accustomed by going to good schools and good neighborhoods and so on. And I really worked on the women, the guys with that. And I had the women sit in rows according to how much money they would earn five to 10 years after graduation, and the professors and so on sit in rows accordingly. And I really worked with the guys to not just go for the women in the back rows that were sometimes the most attractive but just to stay with the women in the front rows. And of course, this is all an exaggeration, um, and, but it helped the guys in a short period of time um, realize that they, um, they had a responsibility to their children. And then the women asked the guys out. And, um, and because the guys had now, I, I tried to get the women addicted to the most attractive guys, uh, the women were now feeling a certain level of status and addiction by asking out the most attractive guys. So there were often eight or nine women comp competing for the beauty contest winner, one of the finalists. And so the women afterwards processing the experience said, up until now in my life, every time I've used the word jerk, I've, it's applied to a male. But this time, I realized I had nine other women competing with me. So I started exaggerating that I had a Porsche. I don't have a Porsche. I said, I'd take him out to the nicest restaurant. I have no idea how much it costs. I just know it costs a lot more than I could afford. You know, and then when he still wasn't coming out with me, I physically took the boy by his, his arm and pulled him away from my competition. I was really a jerk. And I realized that, you know, the jerk, instead of my sort of blaming men for being just jerks, um, I should realize that this is what I did as soon as I feared being rejected. And that, that being that jerk is a compensation for uh, rejection. It's a way of not being rejected. And so, um, and the guy that I pulled away physically was sort of delighted to be relieved of all the competition. And so my physical pulling him away, my exaggeration of my um, money that, and things that I could do for him uh, all won the day, which is really deeply sad. And the guy said, thank you. You know, you've got it. This is the dilemma that we're in. And we're rewarded for being what taken just a little bit too far would lead us to being validly described as a jerk. So what I think I hear you saying more, that jumps out at me anyway, is the old Irish saying, you know, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in, the, in his shoes. We've just simply got to try and understand where each of us are coming from in this modern dynamic, particularly I think where we're absorbed so much with personal autonomy. We've got this idea that we're each the center of our own universe. Yes. And that life is, as Jonathan Haidt puts it, a battle between good people and bad people. To draw that line between good and bad between the sexes is a big mistake. And as you've just said, uh, and you say with John Gray, uh, your co-author and the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, it bears repeating, whenever only one sex wins, both sexes lose. But you must run into this quite often. You move around the, the country. Mm -hmm. I'm on your mailing list. Mm -hmm. uh, I often hear about um, the various events that you're speaking at. Mm -hmm. So you explain these things. How do people react when they're confronted with an uncomfortable reality? Particularly in an age when I think there's been serious misunderstanding between the sexes and there's a fair bit of anger out there. I mean, I, I've heard you know, women that I really appreciate saying, well, maybe it's time the pendulum did swing a bit too hard mm -hmm, so that, mm -hmm. you know, these blokes sort of, um, they need to know what we went through. Yes, yes. And the women are saying, basically, I really don't feel badly that the men are now walking a mile in my moccasins historically. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, there's a number of aspects of that. Um, I started doing couples communication um, workshops around the country. And I started that in part because I started to see that um, if I care about the boy crisis, the boy crisis usually results as a result of a divorce. The divorce often comes from men and women not understanding each other in marriage. And so I didn't want to be in a position of advocating that there be tougher legal um, restrictions on people being divorced. I wanted people to be happy when they were married. And so I started looking more carefully about why do couples um, end up having bad marriages. And the single biggest um, reason is that um, the Achilles heel of all human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. 
And so knowing that, both sexes start walking on eggshells, saying, I don't want to bring this up because my, my wife or husband will just you know, uh, respond defensively. We'll just get into an argument. So you keep it to yourself and you keep it to yourself and you keep it to yourself. And you take and it to work. It, take it to work. It, be, may become, it may become cancer. It may become a heart attack. It may become uh, stress in various ways. It may, it may lead to drinking. It may lead to drugs. It, may, it certainly will lead to affairs. Um, and so, And then those things, of course, you know, create a greater breakup in the marriage. And then the children are devastated by the loss usually of the father, but if it's the mother that's lost, the children are devastated by that as well. And so the workshops I do train people to be able to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. However, it is biologically natural to become defensive when you're criticized. And so I really have to, I had to develop a a workaround to the biologically natural propensity to become defensive when you're criticized. So again, now to pursue a couple of these issues, um, you've worked through some staggering numbers on the result of divorce in terms of the increase in the number of children now who are growing up without their fathers. It's quite extraordinary in America and as you say, this pattern is basically replicated across all yeah. of the wealthy countries. Yes, yes. It's, um, so to give you an example, back in 1965, there was a fellow named Daniel Moynihan who was yep. a U.S. senator and an anthrop um, sociologist and worked for both Democratic and liberal presidents. And he was assigned to do something that ended up call it, being called in, in um, common terms the Moynihan Report. And, and it looked at inner cities and said, you know, why are we having all these crimes and so on in the inner cities? And the uh, and everybody was thinking, oh dear, they're going to come up with you know blacks are you know inferior, but he came up with something very different. He came up with those African American families where there were no fathers involved. Those were the families that were having the problems. But in 1965, that was 25% of African American families where there was minimal or no fatherless uh, father uh, fathers in the family. Today. 32.3% of the Caucasian families have minimal or no father involvement. Among African American families, the percentage has moved up into the mid 70s. And so we have this enormous problem with a lack of fathers and in those communities where there is a minimal or no father involvement or there's a divorce where there was father involvement and now there's a divorce and the children only see the fathers once every a couple of weekends or so, those children feel abandoned by the father and the father isn't able to enforce the boundaries um, with his children and teach them why uh, and, and have the children survive that boundary enforcement and have that be enforced from day to day because he doesn't have enough time um, or the child the father lets the child go to the playground and at the playground the child picks up a basketball game and um, and they get it and the child gets into a fight and um, and the, the one of the kids that there at the playground was a bully and pushed him over and so the the, uh, the boy comes home with a scraped arm and maybe a black eye and uh, the father um, and, but then the mother um, picks the child up for a, you know from quote visitation which by itself is a problematic term um, and then brings the child home and says how did you get this scraped um, elbow and the black eye oh I went to I got got into a fight at the playground uh, what you were at the playground by yourself where was your dad I oh well, he was watching the playoffs aha uh -huh, says the mother the father cares more about the playoffs than she does than he does about um, the, uh, about you I'm really afraid to leave my father with you, the uh, you with my the, the, your dad in the future no, no, it was okay, mom. Uh, no, that doesn't, that doesn't settle it for the mom. What is not explained to the mom is that from the dad's perspective, getting into a fight on the playground um, was no problem, as long as, you know, assuming that it wasn't something super serious. Um, but then if the child comes home and is picked up by the mom, the dad doesn't have a chance to talk with the boy about what happened on that playground. When did you first see the red flag of a boy being a bully? Uh, and what, you know, and maybe you were offered a drink and maybe, uh, the, you know, one boy pushed around another, another boy. Usually there are signs of those things. 
things. And so the father sees his job as letting the child have the experience, letting the child sometimes have a bad experience, then talking with the child about that bad experience to prevent that child from having bad experiences in the future, knowing that a real life experience is a lot more efficacious in terms of raising a child well and protecting a child in the long run than protecting a child and protecting the child and going at the play, to the playground with the child and saying, no, don't play with that person, play with that per, uh, play with this person instead. And, and then suddenly have the child go out into life uh, when it, she or he didn't have any real chance to be, um, have the experience of doing things wrong and being protected. But dads don't explain that to moms. Dads don't even know what they're doing consciously. They don't read in parenting books um, you know, the value of what their contribution is, so they can't explain it to mom. Moms can't hear what dads don't say, so moms are not at fault, and dads aren't at fault because we don't have a culture that helps dads understand that the things that are intuitive for you, letting that child take some risks, letting that child get out of its comfort zones, enforcing boundaries with that child, roughhousing with the child, these are all things that come intuitively to dads. And every single one of them, when I did the research for the boy crisis, I found over and over again that they all have very positive values that I would never have known that the more a child roughhouses with dads, a girl or boy child, by the way, a roughhouses with a dad, the more that child is likely to um, be empathetic toward his brother and sister. The more that child is likely to be able to distinguish being assertive from being aggressive. He's able to be empathetic because the father usually will for, form a bond with the children through the roughhousing. And then when the, um, when the, the children start fighting with each other, um, the, the, the father will often say, you know, sweetie, uh, you, that, that was great that you got on top and you won, won in the roughhousing battle um, or you pinned me down in the wrestling match, but it's not okay that you did that by putting your elbow in your sister's uh, face. And if you do that again, we're gonna stop the roughhousing. Okay, okay, dad, no problem. Um, and then, but then they go back to the roughhousing, the children do it again, then the father stops the roughhousing and then it's the next night that they roughhouse that the, that the children begin to realize, if I don't pay attention to my brothers and sisters' feelings and needs, I'm gonna lose what I want, the roughhousing. That's when they begin to develop empathy by the discipline of knowing they're gonna lose what they want if they don't think of what other people want. Children just don't naturally become empathetic when they're catered to. The more empathetic the parents are to any given child, the more self-centered and narcissistic the child becomes because her or his needs are always being thought of. So empathetic parents do not create empathetic children um, beyond a certain degree. The empathy is important uh, for, from a parent, but you take it too far and it creates the opposite. It creates children that are very self-centered. Just to tease out this roughhousing with kids bit, you write in the book that kids can learn a great deal through that, and boys in particular can learn a fair bit of bit about how to set boundaries for themselves, how to delay gratification, how to be responsible when it comes to setting their own boundaries later in life, yeah. and that that's relevant in the context of what we've seen with some of these horrendous shootings and so forth in this country. Absolutely. Almost always the boys that do these mass shootings that are, end up in prison, um, that end up um, joining ISIS, uh, they're usually b males, they're usually b boys that have minimal or no father involvement, and so their heart is, doesn't have that feeling of love by fathers, and they don't have their testosterone channeled by a male toward a good purpose, um, and so they feel very, um, they, have, they feel like they have a hole in their heart oftentimes. But there's also something else going on that's much more practical. I was talking about roughhousing before, and a lot of people say, oh, you know, the example that I gave with roughhousing um, has to do with a lot with boundary enforcement. Uh, the father saying, no, there will be no more roughhousing unless you think of your sister's needs, unless you understand the difference between that push, which was aggressive, versus a softer push which is leverage and assertive, that's okay. And it's, it comes from experiences like that. But I, I find a lot of people get confused with the, the term boundary enforcement versus boundary setting. So um, moms are often very good at boundary setting. They'll say your bedtime needs to be nine o'clock. 
Um, dads tend to be um, more likely to do the boundary enforcement in a tougher type of way. Uh, they'll say your bedtime is um, 930. Um, and so it is statistically true that dads, when they're parenting, set bedtimes that are later than mom's bedtimes. But it's also to statistically true that the children with dads get to bed sooner than they do with the Is children right? with moms. Yes, exactly. Really? And one of the differences, the differences between boundary setting versus boundary enforcement. So um, dads will be more likely to say, um, okay, you know, you, your um, bedtime is, let's say, uh, 9.30. And, uh, the, but you have to have your homework and everything else done. And if you, and, and if you get everything done, the chores, et cetera, um, done and done well, um, we end up, uh, we can have the time between, before 9.30 uh, can be your time and I'll do anything you want, including roughhousing. Mother's going, you must be kidding. You're not going to roughhouse before bedtime. Um, and the, you know, dad'll say, just let me handle it. You know, but when dads do handle it, um, they find that the children focus on getting everything done. Um, and then they usually do the first few times they do sloppy homework just to get it done quickly. Then the father says, you do it sloppy homework again. Uh, and then there'll be no, um, you know, there'll be no free time at all. And then the child eventually learns to do the homework well, to brush the teeth well, do all the things that, that this, it, they're responsibilities well and still have enough time left over um, before that 930 time. And then, uh, whereas with the mother, the child will learn more frequently to just put things off a little bit. And then it comes to be nine o'clock, the bedtime that mama is at. And the child goes, well, you know, um, I didn't finish my homework yet. Um, and mom goes, oh, well, I don't want him to go in without the homework being done. So let's work on that homework. Well, mom, I did the homework. Now, can I have a story? And then it becomes 9.45 or 10 o'clock. And so that gives you a little bit of an example of that. But let me give a clear example of boundary um, setting versus boundary enforcement. Moms and dads, by the way, all of these things are reversed with some parents. Some dads are like moms and some moms are like dads. Um, but um, dads and moms will both tend to say, um, sweetie, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. And the, so that's the boundary setting. And the children, of course, will do the boundary testing, uh, have as few peas as possible before they get their ice cream, of course. And the difference is, in the boundary enforcement. Um, the with moms, uh, the child will be likely to say something like, you know, mom, I got, I got bullied again in school today. You know, I feel really badly. Um, you know, could, could maybe I have my ice cream sooner? And mom will think to herself, I don't want to get into a huge fight over a big, uh, you know, a few peas when it's, you know, when it's been a bad day. Uh, so, okay, sweetie, I'll tell you what, I have this, you know, maybe 20 more peas and she'll take a knife and set aside those 20 peas. And then the child will realize unconsciously, um, mm, I can manipulate a better deal here um, with, you know, with um, appealing to mom's certain sensitivities, whatever they are, and then uh, try to have 10 peas. And then mom will go, hey, all right, you had the 10 peas. At least you tried. Okay, you can have your ice cream now. Dad is more likely to say, excuse me, um, we had a deal here. The deal here is you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. Oh, dad, you're so mean. Mom doesn't do this. Uh, well, you can. this is my rules, and if you continue whining and complaining, there'll be no more ice cream tomorrow night either. Uh, and then the child goes, oh, shoot. Uh, with Dad, I've got to actually finish my ice cream, um, I finish my peas before I get my ice cream. And so the child with Dad learns, and this is all unconscious, learns that I have to focus on doing what I need to do in order to finish the peas in order to get what I want to have, the ice cream. The child is learning postponed gratification. We'll get to postponed gratification in a minute, but just to say at the outset, it is the single biggest predictor of being successful or a failure, being able to have postponed gratification. In this ele electronic age, that prediction is probably much greater than it used to be because you're constantly being tempted to to be uh, sidetracked by the new, newest text to the newest invitation for a video game, et cetera. And so the child that has that postponed gratification um, is much less likely to have ADHD. So children raised predominantly by dads, only 15% have ADHD in the United States. Children raised predominantly by moms, 30% have ADHD. Because if you look at that example, you can see that the child with the mom is learning not to finish not to put its attention on what it needs to do, but it's learning to put its attention on how to manipulate a better deal so it doesn't need to do what it needs to do to get what it wants, the ice cream.
Whereas with dad, the child has no choice but to focus on what she or he needs to do, finish the peas in order to get the ice cream. So you take that postponed gratification to school, and here was what happens. The child with the postponed gratification can finish their homework. The child with, um, w with the postponed gratification may have, um, uh, may be a tall, good-looking, athletic child, but goes to school, and if he does not have postponed gratification, he can't do the drills that are necessary to be the best basketball player. So mom, or, or a musician or actor, and so mom may discover, typically moms are very sensitive to children's potential and children's dreams, and they may encourage the boy to, you know, sweetie, you have a wonderful singing voice. Why don't you practice and be a good singer? And the child will um, go to practice, get a, maybe a tutor, but won't practice often enough to be one of the best. So she or he doesn't make the basketball team, doesn't make the skiing team or whatever, uh, doesn't make the um, finalist for the play, and and feels badly about himself. And here's the trick. Mom has encouraged the child to dream and pursue his dreams. That is wonderful. But when the child doesn't also have the discipline to pursue his or her dreams, she or he fails. And when the child continues to pursue dream after dream and fail time after time, after a while, after a while the child becomes ashamed of himself or herself and becomes afraid to dream. And that's when a child begins to withdraw, feeling ashamed that every time she or he tries out, they're just the laughing stock because they always fail. Yes, what you've just said is in the book, of course, and that's, I found it remarkable that your research show that perhaps we just haven't appreciated how solid many dads' instincts are when it comes to their contribution. I noticed with our kids, they look to mum from a very early age, for warmth and nurture, mm -hmm. it seemed, me for play and stimulation, mm -hmm. all are necessary. Mm -hmm. But one of the things to draw out of this, I think, is that it would be good, you know, there's a lot of support for women. There's a lot of ways in which they can go out and learn about their role, mm -hmm. what the kids need from them. Mm -hmm. Governments even are in it. Yes. But we don't do the same. As you say, I was unaware of quite a bit of this research until I read the book. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm working now with the White House, and one of the things I'm suggesting to them is to create, if you want to make America great again, you make a, the American family great again. And if you want to make the American family great again, you don't focus on no child left behind until you understand that a child will be left behind if you leave a parent behind. And so trying to create a program called No Parent Left Behind. Uh, but that means having to make sure that the that males are trained well to be good fathers. So we're suggesting the creation of a father warrior program because in the old days, boys' sense of purpose came from being warriors. But today with a, few, a need for fewer boys in war, oftentimes boys have a purpose void. And when boys have a purpose void plus a dad void, that's when they often become destructive. And so I'm, I'm suggesting now that there be a father warrior program to begin to train boys to be involved with the family at a very early age, to know how to change, uh, feed their sister uh, when, you know, when their sister is very young or their brother when their uh, brother is very young, to know how to babysit, to know how to communicate. I'm suggesting that in all elementary schools, there be uh, one of the core curriculum that's required every year is communication skills training so that boys don't bully other boys, so that boys can listen to girls, so that girls can listen to boys, uh, so we know how to listen to each other and overcome those natural propensities just to be me, me, me. And the more the culture becomes me, 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 the more communication skills is important. So I'm looking at communication skills training in elementary schools, but also among, I try to up to scale what I do around the country with communication skills training for couples and saying you can have children trained to be good communicators and not to become, and to become undefensive to personal criticism and then learn that at school, if they go home and they see their, wife, their mother and father arguing defensively, they'll lose respect for their mother and father and therefore the, the family will be destabilized in a different way. So you have to have good, good communication skills from parents, good communication skills from children, and then you have to have things like family dinner nights um, so that children, um, so that mothers and fathers learn how to conduct a family dinner night so it does not become a family dinner nightmare. And look, 
you have a, there's a marvellous quote on this in your book. Uh, and, you know, somebody who's a former legislator it struck me as very significant. You said, next to war, nothing calls for the presence of government more than the absence of dad. Yes. And then you say, and nothing limits the need for the presence of government more than the presence of dad. Precisely. And we started to expand government when we started yeah. to devalue dads. It costs and the fortune. government became a substitute husband. Way. Yes. And it, uh, I estimated when I did the calculations for the, for the boy crisis that it costs the U.S. government approximately $1 trillion a year. And I didn't even do all the ripple effects that I could have done to get to that $1 trillion pr um, uh, price. But if you think of the costs in the United States, you know that the United States has the highest percentage of, of males in prison of any country, in the, uh, any major country in the world. And so um, just, but the cost of keeping males in prison nationwide to the degree that we have them is just a fortune. Uh, the cost of, of all the homeland security in response to uh, preventing ourselves from having another 9-11 uh, and an ISIS type of attack um, is enormous and the, the restrictions of freedom are enormous. So if you want to reduce the size of government, if you want to reduce the control that government has in your life, then increase the um, the efficacy of the family, make the American family great again, and create father warriors where boys learn that instead of having to do military service and to die and be, to kill and be killed abroad, it's now your opportunity to learn how to, uh, to love and be loved at home. Yeah, just uh, on that issue of the cost, I was staggered to read again your research. The United States jail and prison population has increased by more than 700% between the mid-70s and now. Yes. Of that population, 93% are male and they're disproportionately young. Yes. Even if you were so base as to say that the only thing that matters as a taxpayer is money, yes. you'd have to say, we've got to stop this lunacy. Absolutely. But you won't stop it by not sending them to jail. You'll stop it by helping them not be criminals in the first place. That's exactly right. We, are, we have so much discussion in the United States about should it be rehabilitation in prison or should it be, pop, uh, should it be um, punishment in prison? And that's the wrong discussion. The discussion is how to prevent the boys from in getting into prison place. to begin with. Yeah. And the answer, mm -hmm. fortunately, is fairly easy. Um, number one is get fathers involved along with mothers. It's, it's not like father's good, mother's bad. Um, what children who do the best receive is what I call checks and balance parenting. Just like you need checks and balances in government, um, you may hate Republicans, you may hate Democrats, conservatives and liberals, but it really helps to have both having a dialogue about what's going on. And what, what checks and balance parenting is, is like this. Um, say the child comes up to mom and says, mom, can I go back and climb the tree? Um, sweetie, maybe in a few years, but not right now, you're too young. Um, goes to dad, uh, can, can I climb the tree? Um, yeah, okay, but be careful, hon. Um, wait a minute, I just told him you can't climb the tree. Um, well, you, you're, so you're babying him too much. You're letting him risk falling out of the tree and getting a concussion. You want to be responsible for a child with a concussion? That's just cruel, you're insensitive. And then they have a dialogue about it. And if it's a good dialogue where they both hear each other, they might compromise and say, for example, okay, the child can climb the tree, but only up to a certain point, not beyond that. Not these branches because those are too weak. And you've got to be out there under that tree and be willing to sort of um, um, shield them from any fall. Um, and oh, by the way, give me your cell phone. Um, <laughs> so, and yeah. so the dad you know, rolls his eyes, all right. But what the child gets is the experience of climbing the tree with a reasonable amount of risk taking. And no dad explains though to the mom, you know, when that child climbs the tree, he actually increases his IQ. Have you ever heard a dad say that to a mom? But we now know that that's true, that the child's sy synapses are firing uh, ferociously uh, when they're trying to figure out which branch to go on and how far to go in that branch and what can I do to get higher without falling out of the tree. And so the child with that checks and balance parenting got the best of both worlds. He got the safety and the lack of concussion and also got the experience of having that constant decision-making about where do I take the risk and where do I not take the risk. And that's the decision-making that helps a child feel comfortable with risk-taking. 
And, if, and if we look at one of the contributions that dads make to the parenting process is encouragement of risk taking. Um, going out into, you know, ski, skiing, you fall down, you hurt yourself, you cry, maybe I don't want to ski again. Sweetie, okay, I'll hug you here for a minute, but go back and try again. You know, and that's, that's a dad's, uh, and that risk taking, when we don't allow fathers to do that, it hurts not only boys, but also girls. Well, as part of that discussion, we now all need to have as parents and grandparents is to look at this incredible research here that shows that with these societal changes, many desirable outcomes have emerged. Girls are doing a lot better. Mm -hmm. And a great deal of the things that were restrictive for them, that held them back, mm -hmm. prevented them from reaching their potential. Many of those ceilings have been smashed. Yeah. And you paint a picture of girls... Um, uh, not being as badly damaged, still damaged mm -hmm. by family breakup. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, I think I have your numbers right. You say in the 147 American cities today, girls in their 30s will be by about 8% on average higher earners than boys. Yes. And this opens up all sorts of new challenges that hadn't been foreseen, not least of which is that many boys then don't feel there's a place for them. Their protector provider instincts are compromised or not needed. Absolutely, girls don't. Where do go, they go? Girls don't go looking th at unemployment lines for sensitive boys to become future fathers. <laughs> they, this, they want boys who are good providers, and they want boys who are competent, and they want boys who um, you know, who are not part of the boy crisis, uh, who are not failures to launch. And so the boy, attending to the boy crisis is one of the best things we can do for our daughters because I want for my daughter as well. Can, can you just say that again? Because I think that is, yes. a, that is an incredible line. Attending a, to the boy a, crisis. Attending to the boy crisis is one of the very best things we can do for our daughters yeah. because I want for my daughter to be able to marry a boy who is worthy of her love. And fortunately, my daughter, the daughter that's married, has a male who is definitely worthy of her love, one of the most loving, caring uh, husbands and a good breadwinner at the same time. Well, we share that in common too. Yes, but yes, you were telling me about yeah. your children too and yeah. your son and how proud you are of him. And, and you know, uh, I see your heart come through your eyes when you talk about your son and your grandson. And son-in-law, I'm very thankful yes, yes. there, looking yes. after my daughter. Um, I'll get all mushy in a minute. Yes, yeah, but no, this is really important the stuff. two males crying here. Ah. <laughs> White male males <laughs> crying. <laughs> But it is really important, isn't it, that we, I think we understand that we, as, as we, the message here is that we all lose when one sex loses, we all gain yes. if boys are not doing as well and we can start to correct that. You yes. know. We in the feminist movement made a very serious error, an understandable error. We had come through the civil rights movement where there was a group of oppressors and a group of oppressed. Um, and then we went through um, Marxism be being popular around the, around the world where there was oppressors and oppressed. And then we started looking at males and females and we said in the feminist movement, well, men earn more money than women do. It didn't happen to usually be for the same work, although it was at one point that way. Um, but therefore men are the oppressors, women are the oppressed. Um, and we didn't understand that the men when they became fathers, that's when they started earning more money than women did today. So today it's not men that earn more money than women do. It is fathers that earn more money than mothers earn because when they become fathers, they give up being doing the things they want to do, like being a teacher, to become an administrator that almost nobody wants to be um, because the administrator earns more. Or they quit education altogether to sell insurance and they stop selling insurance locally because it makes more money to sell it nationwide. So they experience the father's catch-22, which is learning to love your family by being away from the love of your family an experience you had uh, as deputy prime minister when you and you know you shared with me over lunch the you know the amount of joy that you had and your children had when you said i care more about my family than putting more time in as deputy prime minister and so many men feel they don't have the option to give up what they're what they're selling 
that pays more, that they like less. And so we in the feminist movement never understood that men earning more money was not about male privilege, it was about male obligation, it was about male sacrifice. And instead of saying, instead of as feminists saying, men, thank you for when you had children, which sometimes you didn't even want, that you, that you wanted them and you grew to love them and you were willing to do things that didn't allow you to be connected with the children so you could earn enough money so that your wife and your children would have a, a, a type of um, school system, a type of neighborhood that you wanted for them and they wanted for themselves. Thank you, men, for earning more money than women did, not for the same work, but for as dads giving up what you wanted to do to do what you needed to do Thank you for feeling, uh, and, and I understand, men, that you felt obligated to earn money that often somebody else spent while you died sooner. Thank you for that sacrifice. There's something in the heart of this that is incredibly positive and encouraging, which is that, I mean, I think you'd acknowledge that, of course, there are men who have deliberately gone out there and said making money is more important than the kids, but you do paint based on your research. There's really, um, you know, a tremendous sort of picture that at heart men are, you know, nobly committed to doing the right thing, Absolutely. even if they often behave poorly in explaining it. Yes. And they're often not heard. But now what I want to do is pursue this issue that comes through very clearly. Given that women are doing better in the workplace, earning better money and it's terrific that the chains have been thrown off, but it does create a problem, to, to use language that I think you'd understand, I don't think you use it, but those sort of protector provider instincts, the sort of the tester on lo uh, loaded man who mm -hmm. wants to slay the dragon, mm -hmm. look after the family, mm -hmm. defend them. There are not a lot of wars going around at the moment and we hope they don't come back. I don't think we can guarantee that, but we hope yes. they don't. Yes. It is a different world. And as I've, and I've said this before, people who have watched these conversations will say, don't tell me he's going to refer to it again, but I watched Jordan Peterson in front of a live audience of young, mainly younger people, mm -hmm. uh, young men vastly overrepresented mm -hmm. in Sydney. And what I saw there, because he was giving a tough message, you know, Jordan wouldn't claim to be a rock star or a celluloid mm -hmm. hero or whatever, but they were there hanging on every word, giving him standing ovations. And his message was a tough one. He was basically saying, lift your game, be yes. noble, yes. strive to be better. Yes. And there were young men wanting to respond to that. I think that's tremendously important. Yes. Yes. But how do we get them to clearly see their role in an age when they don't have to slay dragons? That's why I'm saying to the White House, we need to create a father warrior program. A father we, warrior program. Warrior, w a r r i o r. Yeah, yeah. yeah, warrior program, and that that we need to give males a new sense of purpose instead of you know uh, instead of being the ones who are uh, killed and uh, killing um, overseas. Uh, we need fewer of men to do, men to do that. We still need men to do that, but we or people to do that. Um, but we need many many more men to be father warriors, to be trained from when they're very young, to communicate well, to care, to know that caring for their children will be something that will make them attractive. And we have to, in, we have to work with our daughters to be able to fall in love with men who are caring and loving and potentially full-time fathers even, or a certain part-time or full-time fathers. You, in your book, say that the best parent is two parents. Yes. But you have very practical advice when it does go wrong. Yes. And for those who still want to make it work as well as possible. Uh, and I think it centres on things like communication, um, not moving too far apart, not making the mistake of saying, well, I'll get my kids out of here and we'll take them to a different part of the country and move them into a better school, but rather trying to make certain that there really is joint involvement yes. in those children's lives. You paint that is very important. Yes, I would say that one of the things I discovered in doing the research for the boy crisis is that there's a what I would call four must do's if you're going to be divorced. Must do number one is that you have about an equal amount of involvement of the father and mother. Must do number two is that the father and mother live within about 20 minutes drive time from each other so that the children do not um, resent 
the going to another parent's house and having to miss soccer practice or having to miss a birthday party of, a, of one of their best friends. Number three is that the child is not able to uh, he overhear any bad mouthing or detect any bad negative body language when the other parent is brought up, when the absent parent is being brought up, because the child then becomes afraid of speaking positively about the absent parent um, and, um, and, and has to keep the, the, that whole other part of their life to themselves. Number four, that there be consistent communication, counseling or relationship counseling that the mother and father attend. It can be as little as once a month, but um, it shouldn't just be when there's an emergency because emergencies force fast decisions to be made and prevent both the mother and father from understanding the best intent and the logic that leads to each person having a different way of making that decision. And you can disagree with your partner, but at least it's important to know that the woman or man that you divorced has a set of reasons that have the best intent of the child at heart, um, even though they may be different from your reasons. And the purpose of co consistent communication counseling that is not emergency-based is so that both parents can hear what is the reasons that allow them to see that even if I disagree with my wife or my former wife or former husband, that at least they have the best intent of that child at heart. You're very strong on practical things that people can do. The issue of single mums seeking to do the best thing they can by their boys and their girls. Mm -hmm. What advice do you offer in a situation where they're really wondering how best to, to look after their yes. kids' needs? Well, I'll when get there's to, no dad, there's no male there. I'll get to the easy part first and then the tough part second. The easy part is um, the Cub Scouts or the Australian equivalent of Cub Scouts, at least in the United States and I'm sure in Australia too, um, getting young boys involved with other boys um, in a way that they're rewarded when they do things that are constructive and good. And um, also in Boy Scouts, um, boys learn the best of masculinity and the best of character development in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and organizations where there's a lot of boys together and they're learning how to be um, kind and loyal and have integrity and accomplish things. Um, and they're getting merit badges for accomplishing things so that they have a certain amount of status for um, achieving things successfully. Um, it's also important if you're at all faith-based in your orientation to seek out a faith-based community to make sure that the leader of that faith-based faith -based community is a good, constructive, caring, loving, and able to connect male, but most important, that he gets your son involved with other boys his age uh, that, um, that and, and facilitates those boys talking about what's behind their mask of masculinity. All boys have masks of masculinity that make them feel like they have to keep their feelings to themselves, but that makes them feel lonely and isolated and depressed. And so when boys hear that every other boy is, is, has the same insecurities that he has, it frees boys to not have to um, be destructive and to show off and to bully other boys in order to f feel like they're, the they're a number one type of alpha male. Uh, so that's very important. It is crucial to get your son involved, even if he resists it, in sports, in three types of sports, what I call the liberal arts of sports. Um, one is the um, team sports, which is number one and most important um, for sort of obvious reasons. And that's wonderful preparation for teaching your son to get along in organizations, in corporations, um, in, in any group, profit or nonprofit, uh, where um, working as a team is part of the, uh, the what helps you to win and be successful and happy. Uh, number two is pick up team sports. Um, pick up team sports where the boy goes to the, say the um, school and picks up a game. Uh, that's perfect preparation for being a wonderful entrepreneur. Uh, so the boy has to say, okay, who do I want here? This is a stranger. How do I assess this stranger? Okay, do we pull, play full court basketball or half court basketball? What are the parameters? What are the rules? Um, should we allow fouling? Should we not allow fouling? If so, by how much? Uh, who, uh, when this boy tells me to pass the ball to him, is he somebody that just wants to show off or does he have a good angle and a good shot to do? Um, is my girlfriend watching and therefore I'm afraid to 
I want to take the shot myself, even if he has a better angle. All these things are learned. Hundreds of lessons are learned from pickup team sports that have you cre- that don't that don't make you dependent on a supervisor to provide rules for you, but help you learn how to create your own rules. So pickup team sports in the United States is a huge left out um, phenomenon. And then last is um, is individual sports like swimming or tennis or gymnastics, where you have a team that you're contributing to, but your discipline largely comes from disciplining yourself over and over and over again, repetitive, boring types of things like swimming hundreds of laps in order to be the best swimmer. And so all three of those, uh, that creates self-starting skills. Um, And so it's important to involve your son in all three sports. However, I said that's the easy stuff. The tough stuff is if you um, is many times when there's a divorce, a woman will uh, get involved with and marry a man who becomes a stepdad, and so oftentimes she has to understand that a stepdad almost always feels like he can never be anything more than an advisor, unless there's plenty of permission created by the mom to understand dad's style parenting and to understand that its value is very important. So uh, I would most advise reading the 10 uh, steps, the 10 differences between dad's style parenting and mom's style style parenting in the Boy Crisis book, because so many moms have learned that the types of things that they thought were irresponsibility on the part of the father, like the roughhousing or letting the child play in the playground uh, without supervision are actually things that can be used by the right types of fathers toward really long-term benefits benefits of the child, but that does not come naturally to the great majority of moms. And it doesn't come naturally to the great majority of dads to be able to explain that well to moms. And to dads that are listening, if you're a stepdad, you need to do your homework and lovingly explain to your to the mom what your contribution can be. And then also hear what her contribution can be and do the checks and balance parenting of good communication about that. And then um, last, I would say, is as being when you're aware of those nine differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting, you've got to reassess the biological dad and say, is there are there things that he does naturally but hasn't explained to me that will make it valuable for him to be back in the child's um, uh, in the child's life. Because the child looks, especially the boy child, looks in the, in the mirror, and when he doesn't see his father and he feels abandoned by his father, the hole that that creates and the sense of purposelessness that happens with so many boys that don't have dads um, has overwhelmed me um, with understanding the importance of the biological dad uh, because the boy is not the son of the stepdad. The boy is the son of the biological dad primarily. And so um, go out of your way to understand what that contribution is and how important that is to your son. Your daughter has her biological mother in you, and she has the ability to express feelings. Your son does not have his biological father, and he has the propensity to repress feelings. The repression of feelings and the absence of the dad is a terrible combination. Warren, thank you. I I think the things we've been talking about are absolutely critical to the survival of free and open, prosperous Western societies, the sort of society that I want to live in and I want my children and grandchildren to live in. Finally, uh, for the benefit of Australian viewers uh, and and, uh, just for information for you, we have in Australia the Fathering Project. Uh, I'm its national patron uh, and it was born at the University of Western Australia, Professor Bruce Robinson, Practical tips for dads who want to be involved but aren't quite sure how. I can't think of anything that would be more important than a fathering project and a communication skills project. Those are the two most important um, things that would advance um, Western civilized best of society at this point in history. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful way that you both asked questions and listened so carefully and for caring as much as you do. Doubly kind of you. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.